Okay, picture this. A Mars, not just of rusty plains and, you know, silent volcanoes, but a world buzzing, advanced civilizations millions of years ago. Mm -hmm. Now imagine that vibrant world suddenly going silent, not some gradual climate thing, but like, boom, a nuclear <laughs> war. Yeah, sounds like science fiction turned up to 11, right? That's it, totally. And yet that's basically the core of a theory from Dr. John Brandenburg. He's a plasma physicist, PhD from UC Davis, has ties to Harvard too. That's right. And it's... Uh... It's definitely a theory that grabs your attention. Exactly. So today we're diving deep into this. Well, this really mind-bending idea. Could a long-lost Martian apocalypse have been triggered by an alien nuclear attack? The heck of a premise. We've got some fascinating stuff to unpack the evidence he points to, and then, well, the very different story from the, uh, the wider scientific community. Mm -hmm. So for you listening, you know, those of you who look up at the sky and wonder, could Mars have been a cosmic battlefield way, way before humans even dreamed of space? That's what we're digging into. It's a powerful question. And to mm -hmm. really get Brandenburg's viewpoint, we should probably look at his background first. Right. Like you said, plasma physicist, studies superheated gases, electrically charged stuff, got his doctorate from UC Davis. So he has a solid science background, even if these specific ideas are, mm. well, pretty far out from the consensus. Yeah, definitely outside the mainstream. And he doesn't just suggest like one ancient Martian society. He actually talks about two. Right. The Sidonians and the Utopians. That's what he calls them. And his big claim, the one that really makes you go, whoa, is that these civilizations were just wiped out. A nuclear attack, he says, from some other alien species. It's a staggering thought, isn't it? Annihilation on a planetary scale. It really is. And it's worth mentioning, you know, he didn't just whisper this in a corner. Yeah. He's presented this theory at American Physical Society meetings. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, so it's been put out there in certain scientific circles. Even if, you know, it hasn't exactly been embraced widely, it definitely sparks debate. And he believes he has evidence, right? It's not just pull out of thin air. He points to several things on Mars that he interprets through this, uh, this nuclear war lens. Correct. He brings up a few categories of evidence. Things like strange isotopes, you know, atoms in the atmosphere, weird surface features, and even the planet's red color. Okay, so let's get into those clues. What does he see as the uh, the smoking gun evidence? What are the main pieces? Well, one of the big ones he talks about is xenon-129. It's a specific type, an isotope, of the element xenon found in Mars' atmosphere. Okay, xenon-129. And why is that significant? Because, according to Brandenburg, the concentration of it is unusually high, and he draws a direct comparison to Earth. He says it's similar to the isotopic signatures we find in the fallout from hydrogen bomb tests. Wow. Okay, so he's saying, look, we see this specific thing after nukes here, and we see something like it on Mars, therefore. That's basically the argument. He sees it as a potential fingerprint, you know, of a massive nuclear event, maybe multiple events way back in Mars history. What else? Then there's the detection of uh, relatively high levels of uranium and thorium on the surface in certain areas. Radioactive elements. Exactly. And his interpretation is that these could be the leftover byproducts of nuclear fission. You know, what happens in a bomb. Hmm. So more fuel for his nuclear blast theory. Okay, so stuff in the air, stuff in the ground. What about the landscape itself? Does he connect this to any specific features we've seen? He does, yeah. yeah. Surface features are key. He focuses on regions like Cydonia. That's where the famous face on Mars is located. Ah, uh, yes. I remember that causing a huge stir. Right. Well... Brandenburg looks at things in that region yeah. and elsewhere, like what he describes as patches of glassy material, trinitite, like the stuff found after the Trinity test. Melted rock, essentially. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> and he also points to areas with surprisingly few large impact craters. He suggests these could be signs of airburst explosions. Airbursts, like bombs detonating above the ground. That's the idea. A nuclear blast hollow up could, theoretically, melt the surface, creating that glass, and maybe flatten or obscure older craters without leaving a huge new crater itself. So the face on Mars, he doesn't think it's just a hill. He thinks it might be. What? Or artificial? Well, a remnant. That's his interpretation. Maybe a structure, a monument perhaps, yeah. damaged, but still recognizable after this supposed attack. Okay. That's, that's a big leap. It is. And then there's the most obvious thing about Mars, its color. Why is it red? Rust, right. Iron oxide, that's what I've always heard. That's the standard scientific explanation, absolutely. Billions of years of oxidation. Yeah. But Brandenburg offers a different, uh, a much more controversial take. Let me guess. Nukes. He suggests that widespread nuclear fallout spread across the planet 
could be a contributing factor to that reddish color, not just the iron oxide. So even the fundamental color of the planet might be tied to this event, in his view. That's what he proposes. It's definitely a radical reinterpretation. And he puts a time frame on this, doesn't he? When does he think this all happened? He estimates it around 500 million years ago, half a billion years back. Okay, 500 million years, just to put that in perspective. What was happening on Earth then? Well, Earth was really just getting started with complex life. The Cambrian explosion, diversification of the oceans, very simple life forms beginning to emerge onto land. No advanced civilizations here by any stretch. So while Earth was just figuring out multicellular life, he's suggesting Mars had civilizations advanced enough for nuclear war or advanced enough to be targeted by one. Precisely. It paints a dramatic picture, doesn't it? A potential interplanetary conflict happening while Earth life was still, relatively speaking, quite primitive makes you think, especially if you're into space and what might be out there. It really does. Imagine that kind of war, altering a whole planet's look and atmosphere. But okay, we have to address the other side. This theory, as intriguing as it sounds, faces a lot of pushback, right? What does the mainstream science community like NASA say? Oh, absolutely. There's significant skepticism. Decades of missions, orbiters, landers, rovers like Curiosity, Perseverance, They've gathered enormous amounts of data. And that data. It just doesn't show evidence for ancient, advanced civilizations or a global nuclear war. The findings point towards a very, very different Martian history. Okay, so let's break down those specific points Brandenburg makes. The Xenon 129. If it's not nukes, what's the standard explanation? The consensus view is that natural geological processes can account for it. We know Mars had massive volcanoes in its past. Volcanic outgassing could release Xenon-129, uh. or potentially large meteorite impacts, especially earlier in Mars history, could also have altered atmospheric composition, including isotope ratios. No need to invoke aliens or bombs. Makes sense. Natural causes. What about the uranium and thorium he flagged? Similar story there. Scientists generally see those higher concentrations in some areas as just part of Mars's natural geology. Earth's crust isn't uniform either. Some places have more of certain elements than others. It's likely the same on Mars. Normal geological variation. So not necessarily fallout. Not according to the prevailing science, no. It fits within what we expect from planetary formation and geology. And the red color. I imagine NASA's sticking with the rust explanation. Definitely. The evidence overwhelmingly supports the iron oxide theory. We see the spectral signatures of iron oxides everywhere. It's consistent with the planet's long history, its thin atmosphere, the presence of water ice, its well-understood chemical process over billions of years. The nuclear fallout idea doesn't really fit the broader picture we have. Okay. And the face on Mars, that's been pretty definitively debunked, hasn't it? It has. Those initial grainy Viking orbit images from the 70s were suggestive, sure, low-resolution specific lighting angles. Pareidolia, right? Seeing faces in random patterns. Exactly. Our brains are wired for it. But the later missions, like Mars Globe Surveyor, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, they took much, much sharper pictures. And it's clearly a natural landform, a mesa. A big hill, eroded by wind over ages, the face was just tricks of light and shadow on a low-res image. There's zero scientific evidence it's artificial. Right. So, geology, not archaeology. Pretty much sums it up. Now, what about that timeline? 500 million years ago, you mentioned earlier that Mars's atmosphere situation presents a challenge there. Yes. This is a really fundamental problem for Brandenburg's timeline. The scientific evidence points to Mars losing its global magnetic field much, much earlier, probably over 4 billion years ago. 4 billion. Okay, that's way earlier. And why is the magnetic field so important? It acts like a shield, protects the atmosphere from the solar wind, that constant stream of charged particles from the sun. Without that shield, the solar wind just strips the atmosphere away over long time scales. So Mars' atmosphere has been thinning out for billions of years. That's the understanding. Which means by 500 million years ago, the atmosphere would have already been incredibly thin, probably much like it is today, or even thinner. Very little air pressure, lots of radiation hitting the surface. Which makes it hard to imagine complex civilizations surviving, let alone building cities and fighting nuclear wars. Extremely hard. The environmental conditions would likely have been incredibly hostile for any kind of advanced surface life as we can conceive of it, long before that 500 million year mark. That timeline really doesn't mesh with the planet's known atmospheric history then. It really doesn't. It's no. probably the single biggest challenge to the plausibility of the scenario he proposes. Okay, so weighing it all up, Brandenburg's ideas are certainly, you know, provocative, maybe imaginative, 
But the consensus view, based on the data we have, is that they're speculative, not really grounded in the evidence. That's a fair summary. The alternative explanations for his specific points, the isotopes, the elements, the features, are generally considered much more likely and consistent with everything else we know about Mars. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, as they say. And that evidence just isn't there, according to NASA and most planetary scientists. Correct. The bar is very high, and based on current data, Brandenburg's theory... Still, it's a fascinating debate to follow, isn't it? As someone really into space, even exploring these out-there ideas makes you think differently about Mars. Absolutely. And it pushes us to keep looking. Even if there wasn't a nuclear war, Mars definitely had a different past. NASA has found really strong evidence for ancient water, lakes, rivers, maybe even oceans. Right. So a wetter, warmer Mars in the distant past may be capable of supporting life. That's the billion-dollar question. Microbial life, potentially. That's a huge focus of current research, searching for signs of past habitability, maybe even biosignatures. It's a different story than Brandenburg's, but still incredibly exciting. Mars does have secrets. And Brandenburg's theory, even if it's way out on the fringe, it does tap into that deeper question, that big one. Are we alone? Exactly. It forces us to consider the possibilities, however remote. What could happen on other worlds? Could civilizations rise and fall? Could they interact even violently? It expands the imagination. Keeps us asking questions about our place in the cosmos. Which is always valuable. Even fringe ideas can sometimes spark new avenues of thought, or at least highlight how much we don't know about our cosmic backyard. There's still so much mystery out there. And speaking of finding answers, that leads us to the ongoing missions, and especially the future ones. Sample return. That sounds huge for space fans like us. Oh, it's potentially revolutionary. Bringing actual pieces of Mars back to Earth. Wow. Means we can analyze them with the full power of labs here. Far beyond what even the most sophisticated rover can do on Mars itself. We could look for tiny structures, complex organic molecules, detailed isotope ratios. So could that potentially shed light even indirectly on some of these wilder ideas? Or more likely just refine the picture of ancient water and potential microbes? The latter is far more likely based on everything we currently know. It's highly improbable they'll find evidence of nukes or destroyed cities. But science is about exploring. You analyze the samples for everything they might tell you. The potential for unexpected discoveries, however small, is always there. What secrets are locked in those rocks? We have to go get them to find out. It really makes you anticipate those results. So, okay, we've journeyed through this really striking idea nuclear war on ancient Mars, yeah. and we've contrasted it with the uh, the standard scientific picture. Geological processes, atmospheric loss, maybe ancient microbes, quite the spectrum of possibility. It certainly is. A tale of catastrophic intelligent conflict versus slow, natural evolution of a planet. What are your final thoughts for our listeners, especially the space enthusiasts tuning in as they think about these two very different Martian histories? I think the main thing is appreciating the scientific process. Ideas are proposed, evidence is gathered, analyzed, debated. Extraordinary claims like Brandenburg's need overwhelming proof that survives intense scrutiny. And right now, it doesn't have that. Right. The mainstream view, built on decades of observation and analysis, provides a more consistent and evidence-based story for Mars. But at the same time, never lose the wonder. Mm. Keep asking questions. Mars is fascinating, whether it hosted doomed civilizations or just ancient microbes, or maybe something else entirely we haven't even thought of yet. The exploration continues. Absolutely. So you've heard the arguments, Dr. Brandenburg's dramatic theory versus the step-by-step -step scientific investigation. Now, as you maybe look up at Mars tonight, what resonates more with you? Does that idea of an ancient war capture your imagination, or does the evidence for natural processes seem more compelling? It's a good question to ponder. And think about this. What kind of future discovery would really shake things up? What evidence would convince you one way or the other about Mars's deep past? Because the story isn't finished. We're constantly learning more. New missions, new data. Our understanding of Mars is always evolving. It's a dynamic field. For sure. The universe is packed with mysteries and Mars. Well, Mars still holds plenty of its own. Its full story is definitely still waiting to be told.